Okay, hi everyone, it's MythicQ, it's MythicQ.com, and uh, we're going to do another video analysis today. We're going to look through one of my old games. Well, old, it was uh, two years ago, uh, the date of recording, 2017. It was Correspondence Chess. I was rated just over 2100 at the time, my opponent was rated in the mid-1700s, so there was a small, or not so small, rating difference here. I was black, and I want to share this game to really highlight my, um, my thought process when it comes to the attack. In some of my other videos, I've talked about my blitz um, thought process, where I'm trying to make decisions very, very quickly. Here, again, it's a correspondence game, so I had a lot more time, but the actual thought process is remarkably similar. Um, and again, basically on every move, it's, is there a tactic? Can I break through? Do one of my sacrifices work? If yes, I do it. And if I can't get it to work, then okay, I just improve my position. And you just keep doing that, move after move. Because if you improve your position enough, then eventually your sacrifices, they do start working and you've got the finishing blow. That's really what the whole classical school of chess, you know, Terash, Steinitz, and them really preached. You build up your position well enough, and then good things tend to happen. So this game is going to take a look. It's kind of interesting because it gets out of theory as of, like, move three. So I'm black, I actually played the Sicilian. And just a spoiler alert, when I went into this game, maybe it's not a spoiler alert, when I went into this game, I was in one of those foul chess moods where I just wanted to attack, checkmate, crush the king, you know, throw everything out, that was it. Uh, must have had a bad week or something because it's a correspondence chess, but this entire time I'm thinking, I want to attack. Um, and we'll see that um, in the game. So my opponent, he ends up playing the very not critical to c4, and then after e6, he played e5. Uh, and so again, there's no theory. There's absolutely nothing here at all. And so, which is which is great. It's not a question of who's memorized more. It, the who's better at chess. Let's figure this out. What do we do? So the regular Sicilian stuff isn't going to matter. I don't need to worry about whether it's a con or a Taimanov or whatever. Well, this is pawn here. That's temporarily stopping d6, but not really. It'll just be an exchange of pawns. Um, I probably want to get rid of that pawn because it is blocking my natural development. So I can either exchange it or I can um, try and win it. So I developed, he developed, and then I just played d6. If you were to take, 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 then I'm, uh, well, I'm ahead in time. He just developed my bishop for me. He's wasted time moving his pawn. He has no central presence. Uh, really easy position. Again, I've got my knight f6, probably queen c7. You can already see how things would be starting to line up towards the king side, just a little bit. And this would just be a complete opening failure on, uh, on White's part. Which is why he didn't take. He ended up castling. I'm going to take the pawn. Uh, it probably doesn't matter which way you take it. In the game, I took with the uh, with the knight because if I would have taken with the pawn, which is probably perfectly fine in all honesty, uh, he would have this opportunity to play bishop b5 and then recapture with the knight, maybe spoil my pawn structure. And I guess didn't like that. Didn't want to give White that option. So I simply took, 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 then he played rook e1, attacking the pawn. And this is one of those critical decisions that we make in every chess game, and this one happened to become as early as move 7. What do we do? So first off, again, I'm up a pawn, yay. I uh, have no pieces developed, though. He's also attacking and threatening to win it. So what do we do? Now, the most obvious move is probably simply bishop d6. Right, we develop the bishop, though it's staring at two different pawns, so who knows how developed, how active it actually is. The thing is, white could then play queen g4, and now, again, white's got three pieces developed. He's castled, rook on the open file, he's threatening this, what am I going to do? Do I really want to play king f8? So then I can't castle just to hang on to a pawn? I don't, that doesn't seem very good. Other moves, like maybe I bring my queen to f6, 
Well, that's just going to run into knight c3 to e4 hitting the queen. And, again, I'm making some weird, unnatural moves just trying to hang on to the pawn. I'm not, is that really best? What else can we do? Whoops. <laughs> Another possibility would be something like queen c7. But then, after check, bishop d7 take. Well, if I take with the queen, he's going to win the pawn back. And so, that would mean I need to have my king in the center, trying to hit that. No, that, that can't be right. And then, of course, um, the last try would be something like f6. But now this diagonal is weaker, and I'm again not moving pawns. My neg can't go to the best square. And so all of this, uh, to me, suggested that hanging on to the pawn wasn't enough. Or that is, wasn't the best choice. I just played knight f6, returning the pawn. Because then he took, bishop d6, he moves right back. Now look at the difference, right? Before I'm playing f6 or queen c7 or I'm, my bishop was staring at its own pawn, but now it's quite different. Again, bishop staring at the king, knight potentially staring at the king. The queen can come here with that battery. You can easily imagine the bishop coming here or here. We got some attacking possibilities here. Now, in truth, now, again, and now compare that to what was happening before. I'm trying to hang on to a pawn. There was no attack there. White was perfectly safe. And again, I was in that, that foul mood. I didn't want to uh, sit there and defend a pawn. Gosh, no. Let's, let's attack. And that really uh, led to the next move here, where uh, rather uh, atypical for me is I played h5. Is this the best move? I don't know. It's hard to say. But what it is, it's a move with a very distinct plan. Now, again, I could simply castle and then just play normally with a6, b5, bishop b7, or bishop here and here, or what have you, and have a perfectly normal game. I'd be slightly better. I'm a little bit ahead in time. I got a bit more central control, but, you know, it's a game. What have you. By playing h5, I'm really, I'm challenging white. I'm basically saying, I'm coming right for you, get ready. I'm applying a heck of a lot more pressure than if I were to just castle. And white, from this point forward, um, you can tell is really feeling the pressure. Now what's the idea? The idea is, well, let's say he plays d3, and then I come in here. This is actually a kind of an important point as well. Um, when he plays d3, notice how the bishop now um, is stuck behind the pawn. It can't come back. There, we'll see later that this bishop would really love to be back here where it could potentially defend. That would be absolutely excellent, but it never gets a chance to. Anyway, after d3, and then uh, knight g4, so the attack is just coming full steam. You've got here, again, here, here. If you know anything about the, the standard caveman attacks, you can see it's just here. Everything is coming in. And a really common idea in this type of position is to sacrifice this knight. If you can, um, just open the h-file. Also possible, because again, if this pawn were to move, the h-file is completely open, which would be absolutely great, and it brings a piece into the attack. I need to doubt the rook. Another possibility, um, if you just imagine this bishop isn't here right away, or maybe I can push the pawn, would be a horizontal rook lift like this. This is possible. Though, again, right now, it doesn't work this exact move, but it's one of those long-term plans. And so, again, we're getting some aggressive stuff at his king. In the game, uh, he ended up playing g3. I guess maybe we'll just look at the h3 line quickly. If he tries to do this, I don't retreat the knight. I would just keep going. Queen h4. And so, uh, and again, what I'm hoping is that he would just take. Because if he takes after take, take, look at this. We've got this h file. The queen is going to slide in somewhere. Bishop's coming in. Other bishops coming in. He has absolutely no defenders, and um, he's hanging on. This is the only move, but at the same time, if you look at this uh, position with the computer, it's saying that the position is nearly equal. Equal? We're down a piece. You sacrificed a piece. And so that's the computer's way of saying that it's uh, black has excellent compensation. And of course he does. We've got three people, uh, three people, three pieces, and a pawn staring at a king that has no pieces, he has no development. Of course, uh, 
Of course we're doing great. It's not winning, but it's very easy for uh, White to make mistakes going on here. In a practical game, uh, very tough to defend as White. Now it is correspondence, so you have all the time in the world. It's not like it's blitz. We have to make a split-second decision, but it's there. But that highlights this idea that I, I would happily sacrifice that knight to uh, get in a position like this. In the game, my opponent perhaps realized this. He didn't do that. He did something different. He ends up playing g3, which has some positives and some negatives into it. So uh, the positives is he's not immediately opening the h-file, so that's great. He's also blunting the bishop, because it's only staring at uh, some well-protected pawns, so this bishop has a bit less force. There's also some uh, downsides. We can see there's all these light squares are very, very weak. My plan is to get this bishop here, and it's just slicing right through them. Also, this bishop, again, it would if it could come back here to here, white's doing absolutely fine. Can't do that because of the pawn. It's going to cost him time if he wants to get the bishop into that Fianchetto location. And then the other problem is that at any point, I can then play um, h4, which is going to open the h-file up almost by force. It's almost impossible at this point for white to stop the h-file from coming in. Also at this time, as soon as he played this, is I start thinking, again, that, that thought process, is there a tactic? And over the next few moves, there's these common tactics that occur, uh, that I keep looking at, and we're going to see how they evolve. So, the most, if this works, this is the move we want to play. Because after take, this is the idea. Because the bishop is pinning the pawn, um, hitting the king, things look good. The thing is, is after uh, king g2, there's nothing there yet. There, there's no immediate follow-up. Like, our bishop isn't in, our rook isn't in, our queen has to move. He's going to bring his rook over to the file, control everything, bring the queen out. He's fine. So this idea of, of using the queen and the pin, like, it's there. It's thematic. It just doesn't work yet. Another idea, instead of using the queen, maybe we could use the pawn. I'll throw the pawn up. Again, he's going to play uh, king to g2. Maybe we could take... Right? Something like this. Now, his king, it's wide open. But, again, I don't have any immediate follow-up. Right? I can't bring my queen here in h more. I can't bring my queen there anymore because the pawn isn't pinned. He'll just take. I can't bring my queen here because of the bishop. Uh, queen here doesn't really do any doesn't do anything. He can defend quite easily with this, and again, he can always challenge control of the h file. I'm not attacking with enough for this to work. So, in other words, the sacrifice doesn't work. So that was the first step of the thought process. Be back up. Is there a tactic? Is there a breakthrough? And the answer is right now, no, there isn't. So what do we do? We improve our position. I played bishop d7. I'm getting ready to finish development, and again, I want to bring this bishop over here to the to this diagonal. Because if I can get, if all, just imagine that same uh, position, but with my bishop here, glancing. Oh gosh, that's going to be um, devastating. It's my opponent. Knight c3. So the question now is: Is there a tactic? Is there a breakthrough? Does this? We're now on any, just imagine the exact same variations, but now I have the option to bring the bishop over here with check. Does that change anything? Well, let's find out. Take, take, let's look at this variation first. Queen h4. All right, king g2, and now we've got our bishop. It slides in. That looks good. However, after knight e4, he's both hitting our bishop, okay, it is pinned, but also our queen is being attacked, right? Uh, that pawn's only, so we have to move our queen. You know, something like this, this isn't very good either because the queen is hitting our bishop, and again, our queen is down, and then we're just down material. So after bishop c6, knight e4, it looks like white holds. Again, something like f5, uh, it, it isn't working, we're losing our queen. So not enough. Okay, so queen h4 doesn't work. What about the other idea? 
h4. This looks good. This looks really good. So let's say he moves over. Bishop c6, just like before. He blocks the knight. f5. And so we sacrifice the piece. And now we're about to win it back. The thing is, though, if we analyze a bit more deeper, we don't want to just think about white defending. He can actually attack as well. And the reason I didn't play this um, is that white has bishop takes e6. And now all of a sudden the position is getting really freaking messy. Look, rook on my king, wide open. Uh-oh, uh and then take, take. And my king might actually be in some uh, trouble. We could imagine, you know, we just keep going. Take, take. This position is a mess. In fact, if you look at the computer, it's saying it's 0.00, .00 and it's probably going to be, you know, it's a draw by Pretzel check or something somewhere. And that, I think, intuitively makes sense because when we see this position, it's just unclear. That was my final analysis. It's not clear. Maybe I'm doing better, maybe I'm doing not. I don't know. And so when I went back, again, I'm looking at this position. Is there a tactic? Is there a breakthrough? This move, this common tactic, it's very close to working. Very close, but I, I wasn't quite sure. And so when in doubt, improve your position. So I just played bishop c6. So again, it's going to be the exact same variations, right? I, have, I still have these threats here and here coming in. Uh, maybe with queen h4, maybe not. But now I've added the bishop to the attack as well. Right? So that's how this works. Right? You just keep improving your position, looking for tactics. Because if you do it enough, it's going to work. My opponent then played this funky move. So uh, it's kind of clever, right? When you look at it, I, I wasn't expecting it at all. He's using the advantage of the pin. Again, my king is still in the center. And so I can't take with the pawn. That doesn't work. And he wants to see either bring his bishop back to defend, which would be great, or he can just exchange bishops. Uh, this is one of those moves that's uh, a little bit too clever. Um, if you wanted to exchange bishops, this would be the, um, the better approach. Because it's actually physically pinning the bishop. My bishop can't move out of the way. It's forced to get exchanged. Uh, when he played uh, bishop d5, it actually, um, it doesn't work for a really elementary tactic, actually. <laughs> Which is funny, because again, I said I was rated 2100, and it's a correspondence game, and I missed it. So, <laughs> um, it's quite simple. Uh, if you can see it, it would be take, take, and then this here, bishop, ta uh, bishop takes g3, because now the queen has exposed the attack on the knight, so he's going to take back, I take, I'm up a pawn, and we still have our dangerous attack coming in. So uh, that would have like decided the game immediately. My problem is that I was hoping I got to keep my bishop, because I, I spent the last two moves trying to get this bishop into that square, and I was secretly hoping that he's not going to take it, that I didn't need to exchange the bishop. Um, so I, I wasn't looking at all the candidate moves. Whoops. I ended up playing queen c7. And this would have allowed him to simply um, take in it. I would have taken back. Uh, but again, I've spent several tempi losing my bishop, essentially. He's going to play knight e4. Again, he's hitting my bishop. The knight's a rock on the center. And he's going to be okay. Or at least the computer says um, there's no decisive attack even though the position's silly. I mean, black's still doing great here, but the attack isn't coming through. And this makes sense, right? If we're to, whoops, I just gave away the move, is that when you're being attacked, you want to trade off the potential attackers. My opponent didn't do that, though. I think what was happening, if I can get into the psychology of my opponent, is that, again, if you remember these weak squares, whoops, what color? Let's make them red, around his king. I think he was very concerned about that. Because... He ended up playing bishop f3, keeping, um, keeping his light squared bishop, so that way he could defend. The thing is, it's, again, it's one of those uh, funny things. 
If he were to exchange light square bishop for light square bishop, uh, these weaknesses don't matter very much. I mean, they do, but they also don't. It's much easier to take advantage of these weaknesses if I have the, uh, the light square bishop. That's just the way it works. If I don't have it, uh, it's a lot harder. For example, my dark square bishop can't touch them, obviously. And so trading the light square bishop for a light square bishop, I, it would be fine. It, you, could, uh, you can try and look at the position. It's really hard to get the attack without this bishop. When he played bishop f3, I'm pretty sure he's thinking, okay, I get to, he gets to keep his bishop, and he's forcing this knight to move, because otherwise he's going to win a pawn. I'm fairly certain that was his thought process. But it's completely mistaken. I simply castle. I don't care if he wins the pawn. I've been trying to sacrifice that knight for like the last ten moves. <laughs> sure, I taking... I mean... That, 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 that's practically suicide. Uh, look, I've got all this stuff coming in, and they're, they're, uh, something's going to slide over, and, and things are great. And in fact, there's actually a, um, a devastating tactic here in this position. It's rook h2 immediately. And of course that makes sense, right? Because we're attacking with absolutely everything. He's got few defenders. i got bishops staring at him. And now notice, uh, he tra when we back up, Right? I, I talked about the power of the light square bishop. If he trades bishop for bishop, that's absolutely fine for him. Right? He's able to defend because it's hard for me to take advantage of the, of the light squares. But when he exchanges it for the knight, well, now this bishop's just an absolute monster, and it decides the game. Because after take, he can't take back um, because that's a really simple mate. Or he has to give up his queen, a whole bunch of material, and the, the game is just over. The really thematic uh, attacking ideas here. So, of course, he doesn't take. This is his, uh, probably his last chance to uh, actually exchange bishops here. Um, again, um, he has to face a harder attack now because he lost some time moving his bishop back, but that'd be the idea. Instead, he played h4. <sighs> now, again, we can see why he played this move. Or we can kind of feel it, right? What was happening? What were we looking at for the last uh, few moves? We're looking at knight takes h2. We're looking at these h4. Um, when the queen was here, at the queen coming into h4. And so he's trying to block everything up. But moving pawns near your king, especially when you're being attacked, it always creates weaknesses. If we back up, notice how both of these pawns, uh, right? Um, this is a standard... Uh, what do they call it? Your um, this battery is aiming at granite. That's that's it. It's it's solid, very solid. When he plays h4, all of a sudden sacrifices right here they look really pretty. Or maybe a sacrifice here to weaken this square. Or maybe something like if I can get rid of there we go f6 and uh, g5, just trying to force things open this way. Is there something? And so then again, leads to that thought process. Is there a tactic? And we've been looking um, constantly throughout for some tactics. And finally here, um, it's going to pay off. It's not knight takes h2, because there is no knight takes h2. But what, what else is thematic? Well, of course, if bishop takes g3 works, then uh, that's everything. And it, of course, it does rather simply after... Simply, whoops, he didn't take in the game. If he were to take, well, that's just queen takes g3. We're going to mate on one of these two squares next, uh, no matter what he does. I kind of like this mate. That's kind of pretty. And so taking is simply out of the question. Um, he ended up taking my knight. Um, but again, this is him exchanging or losing his light squared bishop while I still have mine. And so, of course, the attack is going to be absolutely unstoppable. So, I took, and then he played knight e4. Um, again, taking is still out of the question. After queen takes g3, it's going to be the mate on g2 this time. Knight e4. And if we recall in some of the previous variations, this was an excellent defensive try. It's blocking this bishop, it's fully protected, um... 
Well, okay, it's not protected by the Pawn, but it's also protected by the Rook. It's also protecting F2, and it's protecting um, G3. Trying to get something in here. So, it's probably, probably his best. At the same time, though, um, this position is just completely destroyed. And so, I just took the Pawn. This is simple. Fully opens the H-file. And every, again, everything is coming in. I can still play F5 at any point to kick him away. And the game only lasts a few moves later. He ends up playing uh, queen takes g4. Uh, sure, that just runs into f5. Funny enough, queen takes g4 is actually the computer's uh, top choice here, even though it blatantly loses a piece while opening up more lines. And uh, that's clearly, I'm not even down material at this point. And so we'll just look at this really, really quickly. I end up winning the knight. I then bring all my pieces over to the queen side. And there's not much to talk about, because here he, uh, the rook slides over, pins the queen, and that's it. So at this point, again, the game was completely over. Um, he was t too weak, and I could have played just about anything. I'm not even sure if my moves were the best by the computer. Uh, but by this point, it's already minus 10, minus 9. Uh, when we do this sacrifice, yeah, it's minus, uh, it's 8 in favor of black. And so the game, again, it's over. And again, of course that makes sense. We're attacking with everything. Now, I, I share this game not just because it's a pretty attack, yay, what have you, woo, go me. It's the thinking process behind that, where we systematically worked it up. Compare this sacrifice, right, with Knight, you know, where it's clearly winning, versus, you know, the position back around, was it here? Where we weren't completely sure if take, take, and h4. Right, because then we're analyzing and we're looking at you know positions like this, and it's hard to tell what's happening. Who's better? Who's worse? Just by improving our position just a little bit from here. Sorry. So from this position to just basically three moves later, we'd improve our position enough that all of a sudden now the sacrifices went from unclear to completely winning. That's the power of the thinking process. And if you do that, what it does, it, it helps you both think um, in terms of tactics, short term, right? Is there a tactic? Do I have something? But it also helps you long term in your, your strategic ability. Is there, how do I improve my position? Now, this is simple enough that you can use in Blitz. And again, I've shared that with some of my Blitz videos. But it's also powerful enough to use, again, in correspondence chess, where I'm able to, um, I beat a fairly decent player, right? Over 1,700, whoops, I gotta be careful. Uh, in under 25 moves with a fancy little attack. And it was completely um, over by move 15. Right? That's it. And so uh, it's really powerful and it's not just for blitz. And it helps organize your thinking. You're not gonna miss tactics if you're constantly asking yourself every move, do I have a tactic? And you're not going to only look at tactics if you're also reminding yourself, how do I improve my position? Now, of course, actually being able to improve your position, that requires a whole host of abilities. And same thing, is there a tactic that requires an incredible amount of calculation and pattern recognition? So it's not like you can just follow this, yay, and then you'll be Magnus Carlsen, right? But again, it helps organize your thinking which in chess is really about, you know, half, maybe even three quarters of the battle. So I, I wanted to share that. The full an um, annotations are on my blog. They're also um, on uh, Lie Chess. Um, I have a full study, I'm gonna link it here, which has everything, basically this entire board that we just saw, but also the written notes. So you got the blog, you got them here, you got the video, got all sorts of things. But of course, none of that, the real takeaway is the thinking process. That's how I found these moves. Um, and that's how I led this attack. So there you go. I hope that was interesting. Hope that was helpful. Hope you didn't see this. Again, if you've read my blog, you would have seen this game uh, previously, but now, now it's in video format. So hopefully it's that much better. Uh, questions, comments, you know, concerns, anything at all? Uh, criticisms, you know, if you hate the video, just let me know and then I'll see what's going to happen. Um, otherwise, um, that's it. So let me, let me know if you like this or not. That'd be great. So I'm, uh, again, SmithyQ, SmithyQ.com. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.